cyberpunk anthologies. That's what we're talking about today. Welcome to Outlook Bookseller with me, Steve Lee Andrews, the voice of SF Experience. And I want to talk about two works today. Recently, I started reading a lot of anthologies and I've just finished Silverberg's New Dimensions 3. And this is the second volume I've read. I don't have number two and I review number one during my last sort of collector's diary. And I want to cover this and I will cover it in some depth and I'll do that at the end of the video. I want to talk about a couple of other things first because there's a story in here which I hadn't read for a long time and rereading it a long time after the first time really sort of made me realise how important it is and because the world has changed a lot since I first read this. And in the background you'll hear the machineries of joy are turning as we move into the future and as we discover that the past showed us where the future was going before we even realised, which was amazing. So cyberpunk, cyberpunk precursors. You see certain things come up, Delaney comes up a lot best, occasionally Moorcock, but they're sort of smaller and more subtle things as well really. And one aspect of cyberpunk is the sort of corporate aspect, the part which is about capitalism and particularly marketing. And I want to talk about that a bit today. And of course, we live in the age now of social media, of very hot media like YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, all those sort of things. And we have done for some time and they are changing our consciousness. But actually, people imagined them a long, long time ago. I mean, Orson Scott Card was writing about message boards and the internet and how people could be influenced and that happens in Ender's Game towards the end of Ender's Game where the um, the three children are sort of you know influencing people politically. Social media influences we think it's a new phase but actually SF got it right a long time ago and the corporate side we're all marketing ourselves let's be honest about this when we're on social media, whatever we do, we are projecting an image. Sometimes we are projecting our authentic selves. Sometimes it's carefully edited. It's a creative act. And anybody who says they don't do this is probably, you know, <laughs> not being entirely honest. And you think of social media and um, you think of the phrase virtue signaling is interesting. Where at the moment, the marketing is all about, if you look at advertisements and things, it's all about getting across the idea that companies and individuals are good people that we're kind to minorities that you know we want to put the evils of the past behind us and of course companies are doing that let's be honest about it that some of them you know obviously do have good agendas but there's also the cynical part which is that we're ethical you can buy from us and not feel guilty and it's the exploitation of that guilt both at corporate and at individual level and people online how honest are we will we say what we really think will we critique things and it's very interesting because often the image that's put across by the media through marketing and advertising is completely irrelevant and it's an interesting thing if you look at the UK now we have about a 4% population are people of colour, black people. I don't mean other things. I'm talking about Afro-Caribbean um, and African ancestry. And in, if you watch advertisements, television programmes, you'll see that actors and people working in those sorts are massively overrepresented proportionally. Now, there's no reason why there has to be proportional representation or disproportional representation. It just is. But you get very cynical because you think the marketers are just trying to say oh look we're being inclusive and things so you have to be a certain certainly sort of cynical about these things about what is being sold to you and that affects us all and is patronizing to people in minorities as well I think it's terribly patronizing you know it really really is so but that's another debate but that's just to sort of put that out there and say something about marketing and one of the sort of interesting cyberpunk precursors which I like and we're talking about the corporate side now because there's the cyber side, the punk side, but there's also the thing, if we look at the classic cyberpunk narrative, Neuromancer, corporations run the world, you know, and we're seeing that globalization, which, you know, used to be a word which we didn't like in the late 80s and now we're seeing all this globalization. It's like Marshall McLuhan, there's no borders, people can do what they like.
course that suits capitalism the gig economy let's make it cheaper let's force a diaspora to get people to move to other places so we can exploit them factories closed down in north america they reopen in mexico and so on it's been going on since the 80s there's nothing new and going on before that people used to move in the age of the industrial revolution for work but we're seeing it more and more and more globalization a good thing possibly not anyway let's talk about the corporate thing in cyberpunk and the fact that that's always there in the dystopian background and a classic example of that can be found in a story in this anthology this is a very common anthology luckily and i'd urge you to go out and buy it it's a good anthology anyway as you see it's the u.s best science fiction number seven edited by aldis and harrison those two old worthies and this came out let's have a look way way back in the 70s 1975 and it contains a story which had been written a little time earlier and that story is called rollerball murder rollerball murder and it's by um, william harrison there's lots of other great stuff in here as well and um, william harrison there's one collection of short stories he did screenwriting and Rollerball Murder was made into a film in 1975 called Rollerball and you can see the soundtrack behind me and when I was a kid when I was 12 it was really big and it was seen as a kind of successor to A Clockwork Orange which came out a few years previously and a classical music soundtrack with some synth on it and I've had the soundtrack since since I was 12. I had a Rollerball t-shirt at the time it was a double A I was too young to actually get into the cinema to see it at the time I'm a big fan of the film it's very slow and stately and it depicts a world where corporations rule and the story is new the story is 10 pages long and it is word perfect it's immaculate it's one of the finest science fiction stories I've ever read one of the finest short stories I've ever read it's a work of utter and absolute genius so there is a book called Rollerball Murder which has the story and Harrison's other stories in it. It's quite hard to find. This is much easier to find. Do get this. If you could find Rollerball Murder, good for you. I used to have one and I don't know what I did with it. And of course there was a tie-in edition. So try and get a copy of this and read it. It's 10 pages. That film is something like two, two and a half hours long. And everything, every single idea in the film is in that 10 page story. And there are some differences and it's incredible. Now, if you're not familiar with Rollerball and here's the soundtrack on CD, I've got the Blu-ray as well. I'm a bit of a Rollerball nut. There was a terrible remake and it works on the idea that in the sort of post-religious world, Mark said, of course, that sport is the opium of the masses. Well, he didn't. He said that religion was the opium of the masses. But you notice how that slipped out? Turn on the TV, turn the news. You watch a BBC News programme, half of it is sport. There's an hour of it and half an hour is sport. Sport is the opium of the masses. It stops us from thinking because we enjoy it. And it's the physical pleasure. We get to indulge our, art of, our artivistic urges to be part of a crew a crowd a gang that's all it is you know it really is and you know i'm not a sporty guy as you can probably tell but in the world of rollerball sport is the opium of the masses and there's been something called the corporate wars and the corporate wars are not really described in any detail but they're over and you get the impression that those wars came about because of competitions between corporations and nation states and now there's no competition in the world between corporations. The only competition is on the rollerball court. And the rollerball is, it's like a 1950s Robert Checkley kill game story, like the seventh victim. It sublimates all the urges that the populace have, whether they're executives in the corporations or whether they're part of the masses, the need for violence, the need to belong, to cheer, to shout, to sweat, to scream and to belong to something bigger than oneself and subvert oneself into the mass. I find that quite scary myself. I'm too much of an individualist. And if you've never seen Rollerball, do check it out and do get the short story. And the corporations, they, they no longer compete instead they're mutually supporting monopolies and none of this is said but you can intuit it from the way things are laid out 
um, the cities and the, the central character of, of Rollerball, Rollerball Murder, the story, is a character called Jonathan E, who's a sportsman, and he's brilliantly played by James Kahn in the film, who was excellent at sort of inarticulate but sensitive jocks. You know, that was one of his really sort of big key things that he was really good at. The corporations as kind of prop each other up. I mean, Houston is the team that Jonathan plays, or Jonathan E, and Houston is the energy city. That city in North America provides energy for the society. There's an entertainment city, a food city, and so on. So you get these corporations and they have complete monopolies. They can sell these goods and services to the people worldwide and they're not competing. So they prop each other up and keep the system stable. They have to interact so the energy city gets energy to the manufacturing cities and so on. And it's like the three super states of 1984, which is all reveals in the novel. You know, they are at war simply to burn off surplus goods so the people in them remain subdued. The people have war fever. That's their team. So there's a parallel. But the world of Rollerball appears like a utopian dream rather than a dystopian one. But the people are controlled by consumerism, by marketing, and it's all sublimated into Rollerball. And the game gets more and more savage. Can one man stand up and rebel and lead the people to see what's happening? Get a copy of this, it's fantastic. So that's the sort of corporate side of was there in the background. We'll talk about the cyber sort of stage before that um, in another video. There are sort of precursors before that, but the corporate thing can't really, really, really be avoided and the machinery turns around. I want to turn then to this and the story which I said I reread. I say New Dimensions 3, um, published in 1973. And the story I want to talk about is The Girl Who Was Plugged In by James Tiptree Jr., Alice Rakuna Sheldon. And he won the Nebula Award in 1974. And of course, the Nebula Award was awarded by the Science Fiction Writers of America. So it's a writer's award given to writers. So one would assume that there's a higher critical standard. Now, if you don't know who Alice Sheldon was, the interesting thing, she was, she used this name, James Tiptree Jr. And nobody knew she was a woman for many, many years. And a very interesting life. She was born in 1915 and she was American. And she did do a very early story, I think, in the 1940s. And she used a pen name because she said that she'd been in a number of occupations where she was held back by being a woman. So she decided to pick on James Tiptree Jr. And apparently she got the Tiptree off a, a jam jar, something like that. And she was really quite acclaimed and very, very interesting. And she started sort of publishing stuff sort of late 60s, early 70s, and immediately started to strike a chord. Her parents were travellers. Her mum's a travel writer, wrote over 30 books. And she sort of really sort of, you know, sort of saw the world. So there's a similar thing to Lagan going on there. Lagan's parents, of course, were um, anthropologists. So she travelled a lot as well. So she basically went to various schools around the world in Europe and Africa, and fundamentally, she basically went into the um, into the military and she ended up um, after being in the army during World War Two and then the Air Force. She ended up in intelligence, rather like Cordwainer Smith. And we'll come back to Cordwainer Smith recently. And she worked there really well. And then she went to um, study psychology in the 60s. And um, she was an art student as well. She's a multi talented woman. And what she actually did was to sort of relax from her psychology study. She started writing SF. And from the beginning, she really took off. And in here, there's a, a fascinating um, little introduction by Silverberg in which he says, basically, you know, nobody knows who this James Tiptree is. He's amazing. He sort of operates out of a post office box. Normally, writers are very gregarious was talking to each other. It doesn't happen with Tiptree. You know, he's very quiet. And he actually wrote a piece where some people say, and I think she's a woman. And he said, no, she's a man. She can't be. She can't be a woman. She's a man because of any cited things in the stories. And of course, he was wrong. One of the few times Bob was actually wrong. And just to sort of skip forward. So she produced work for about 15 years. 
and then she died in an strange and obscure murder-suicide cult with her husband who's about 70 and um, and basically um, one killed the other and then the other killed themselves and we won't sort of go into that because it's a bit distasteful but very very interesting thing and the story I want to talk about which is in here is called The Girl Who Was Plugged In and it's I this is the first time I've read it for a long time as I say because I read it in another anthology and I realized um after reading it that I had this book in work Warm Worlds and Otherwise published by Penguin Penguin Classic Science Fiction this is about 15 18 months ago and I thought that this was a retitle of another collection and that I had everything in it I looked at it and I found that I didn't and it has that story in it and others some I haven't read so I snapped that up straight away so I will review that for you when I've read it all because there are four or five collections of short stories only two novels the two novels are behind me in an omnibus edition there um, Up the Walls of the World and Brightness Falls in the Air Up the Walls of the World was a pan lozenge and her most famous collection is the first one, 10,000 Light Years From Home, and that's available like that as well. And I had a pan lozenge to that, and I got rid of them because they were really cruddy. So I've got a new penguin copy coming, because I'm going to reappraise her because I'd forgotten how interesting she was. Fundamentally, the girl who was plugged in, I'll tell you a bit about it because it's really germane to understanding early cyberpunk, and particularly William Gibson. So it's about a young girl in the future who's kind of an ugly duckling well nay she's an ugly adolescent she's in to you know what appears to be a boy band a trio um which we're called breathe or breath i think it is and you know like everybody else in this future like our future you know she's marketed at and she's sucked in by it because she's young and impressionable and nobody reads very much in this future world and you get the impression it's conveyed very subtly there is a kind of internet immersive virtual reality thing going on and she's out in the street one day and she's injured hospitalized and she's taken to this hospital and she's made into the thrall of a corporation and this corporation store her body in a Cronenberg-esque clamshell device in a vault and they save her life but they wire her consciousness to a vat-grown cyborg body which is part flesh part machine cyborg you know what that is and she's kind of indoctrinated and she is talked to by the heads of this sort of corporate body she's offered a chance to help investors who are making wonderful new things for the world to help the manufacturers because if they can't get them out for people to see they could fail and all their hard work will go what a shame so she's and they say if you do this you might get to meet breath your idols and she agrees she's impressionable she's always been this ugly duckling she's never had any luck and you know it's very 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 sad in lots of ways so she is in thrall so she emerges from this clamshell like venus from the foam except she doesn't her body and her brain are there they're just wired through to this persona occupying this beautiful body and they call it delphi because she comes from philadelphia delphi and of course this echoes classical greece the oracle at delphi and you know delphi the oracle there was the foreteller of the future and this story is a foretelling of the future very 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 much so there's a narrator's voice in this story which is asserting itself every now and again occasionally not just enough not too much and it's very sort of hard-edged and cynical but it sort of weaves in and out and it reminds you that this is a story the teller of the tale is spelling out in capitals that this is a f the future it says this is the future remember and hinting that this may be a warning and this voice just comes in now and again and it's really sort of beautifully done because it's not overdone it's not underdone it's just right and it's cynical and harsh and knowing and winking and is it the voice of Tipri? it's the voice of now talking about the future so it really is sort of works as prophecy and you know they say science fiction isn't prophecy you know critics are always saying that but sometimes it is and it's often the reflective rather than the specific but in this case it's really seems specific to me so Delphi sort of becomes more than just a handy social media influencer in the lens of the holocams and you know that's right this is what's imagined in 1973 before the word social media influencer before that phrase before we had social media before we had the internet it's 50 years ago in 1973 and 
The kind of sort of virtual internet web, the web life of the future isn't fully described, but it's a virtual space that's there and it's implied. And it's clever in a way that she didn't actually go and try and explain it and instead just imply it because it works so much better. So Duffy becomes an icon. She wear a dress, which is, she's wearing it. So people say, oh, look, I'll have that dress. And the manufacturers are geared up and they roll it off. She wear an earring and it goes from there. But of course, because she becomes this post-war holy and idol, it skews demand. And something that you're not expecting is one part where she, where she has a macaw on her shoulder and she's on a yacht. And all of a sudden, everybody wants these macaws, these parrots. And it threatens the economy as manufacturers rush to meet the wave of those market needs to stay on trend. So the manipulation sometimes takes on a life of its own, as capitalism often does, and things trend, you know, and that's social media influencing. Like, this is going to get zillions of views and everybody will rush out and buy this book. He said laughingly, they won't because I'm not young and beautiful, but there you go. But Delphi is, that's the whole point. And it's fascinating stuff because you're seeing this focus on the marketing and selling of products products through this being who isn't quite virtual but isn't quite real either she's physical but people don't realize that she isn't real she isn't the real thing she's a construct but like William Gibson's Neuromatsa this is an old romantic story with a large R and a small R it's romantic in the sense of seeking the sublime but it's also a love story a small story and as the story unfolds, we see the influence that is there upon Gibson. And Delphi is rather like Tally Isham, the Sim Stim star mentioned in Neuromancer and the Sprawl stories. Sim Stim, where the sense impressions of a performer, an actor, a person on a ski slope, whatever, are recorded. And then you can play them back. You jack in and you get the experience, even though you're not there. Ultimate virtual reality thing. And there's a bit in Neuromancer where it sort of talks about how it's carefully edited in case Taliesham gets a headache. And, you know, Delphi is like Taliesham and she falls for the rich son of an old count that she has an arranged marriage with. And the count who's sort of like very deftly and briefly described, you know, and has a talon like hands. He reminds you of, of Julius Dean from New Romance, you know, an old man in a world of the young. And you get the feeling that, you know, he's he's like the Tessier Ashpools, you know, he's got immortality treatments. He lived for a long time. And his son is called Paul Isham III, Paul Isham III. And remember, Tally Isham, Paul Isham III, like three Jane of the Tessier Ashpools, you know, in the climatic sequence of New Romance uh, aboard the Villa Straylight. It's just <laughs> incredible. There's those things there. And there's more evidence for Vincent Gibson. Names like Quine come up. Bobby Quine, you know, comes up in the sprawl stories in Neuromancer. It's also a reference to um, Quine, the guitarist from Richard Hell and the Void, who's a huge Velvet Underground fan. Gibson was a Velvet Underground fan. He would have known who Quine was, very, very much so. A VU type guitarist in Lou Reed's band later on after Reed quit the Velvets. And Tesla comes up, you know, the ultimate electrician, the girl who was plugged in. You've got to have a power supply to plug into. And Tesla, of course, the legendary rival of Edison, immortalized by Christopher Priest in The Prestige and played by David Bowie, another hero of the proto-punk revolution, or before that, the glam revolution, which led into punk. So you also see Tiptree sort of thrall falling upon Bruce Sterling as well. I kept, re when I was reading the story, and I say it is in here, as I say as well. So that's another way for you to get it, because New Dimension 3 is harder to get. Um, I kept thinking of St. Anne Twiceborn, the female character, and the artificial kid, who's another anti-hero of the pre-internet, internet in SF. The girl who's plugged in is stuffed with words like online and implant. And I was thinking, when did I first hear the word online? And it was an album by um, Robert Calvert, the dead singer of Hawkwind, the dead singer, dead singers, let's say, um, a Michael Moorcock story about Jimi Hendrix coming back to life. That's a good story, good new wave story. In that, there's a song called Online, and he's on modems and it's early hacking and stuff. And you know, if a wow, that's really futuristic. And then this is this is like 73, not 86, when that came out. An implant comes up, and obviously, you know, there are people jacking into machines in SF going way back. I think there's some of that in. 
it's either in Jack Williamson or um, maybe Edward Hamilton. It's, it's in, you know, it's in one of the golden age guys, you know, the man machine interface. It's not, it's not as developed, but it's there, you know, it's not the man machine idea, the Kraftwerk man machine cyborg idea, isn't that new? But going back to the story, Paul Isham three, he's a gilded rebel, he's rich, but he reads and he's not taken in by this sort of immersive virtual world that people are being sold in. So and he can see how it's ruling people's minds and how there needs to be a revolution to break up. And he wants Delphi to break free, not knowing that the real her, the real body, her real persona is elsewhere. And in its pace, and it's a great little novella, it's not too short, it's not too long, I could see the feverish, frenetic shadow of Alfred Best, the looming over Tip Tree. The story reminded me of the sort of masterful story I love by Best, and one of those I really love from Dark Side of the Earth, probably my favourite SF short story collection, a story called Time is the Traitor, which is from the 50s, which is a tale of hidden past, of obsessive love, of high business stakes and vengeance. And in a way, Time as the Traitor is very like the Demolished Man and um, whenever I read it and I've read it so many times it must be 20 times it's, I love it I can see it as a film I'd love to write a screen treatment for it it would work really well as a high action pure SF film without losing any of its bite and Duffy's entrancing in the story she's rather like the clone of Seema Morgan the female character of Time as the Traitor who is described as a busty dazzling brunette the classic bestie yarn, the kind of femme fatale of the best would always come up with and would paint with such small strokes like a Japanese brush artist and yet you feel it, you know, you feel the, the rising admiration in your body for these, these wonderful heroines he could create with just little dashes of a black cocktail dress. Oh, amazing. And this again is where the narrator comes in, nudging us, pushing us, ruefully nodding and spitting sardonically in a kind of rictus parody of a smile like the Joker's. And it's a fantastic story. The girl who was plugged in and it's in warm worlds and otherwise. And it really is an important cyberpunk precursor. You should read it. And it's very, it is the cynicism and, and the flash of it is just magnificent. It's that great bridge between Besta and Cordwainer Smith and Gibson. And it really is a wonderful story. And it's really made me want to go back to her work because I think she was in lots of ways ahead of her time. Some of her things remind me of Delaney and as I say it's a long time since I read much but I really enjoyed reading that in New Dimensions 3 and I want to cover New Dimensions 3 now. Just to sort of talk it up a bit I'm going to pull the mirror shades off because we've kind of done that cyberpunk thing right? We really have, we've done the cyberpunk thing. What can we say about it? Well it's a mixed bag again and um, there are some great stuff in there. I mentioned recently in a video that there's a story in here called The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas by Ursula K. Le Guin. And again a story I'd read but I'd read it for a long time and oh man it took my head off. And it's interesting because it's the flip side of this. It's Le Guin at her most measured and stately and it's a short story again and it very much reminded me of what I love about early Lagan, where there's the, that thing about care for the world, the high dagger and care for the world. And it's about a place called Omelas, where everybody seems to have a perfect sort of life, but there is this child, this captured child hidden away, like Caspar Hauser. If you're not familiar with the legend of Caspar Hauser and Werner Herzog's film, The Enigma of Caspar Hauser, Caspar Hauser was a, a child who just turned up in a Germanic village um, quite some time ago. I can't remember exactly when, was it the 18th century? And, you know, it was rather like a feral kid and said he'd been kept in a cellar and, you know, liked wooden toys. It's a really interesting story. It reminds me of that. There are a handful of people who are not satisfied with the way that this child is treated and they walk away from Omelas. And it's a wonderful story that says, you know, we have to care. We have to really wonder and think about the downtrodden and the different and the oppressed and you know that's very very laudable and it's interesting now in social media we're seeing that thing where that care is drifting the other way and it's becoming all pervasive and the need for rebalancing is turning into revenge and I think it's really unhealthy but wonderful story and Lagan later on by about 90 early 80s she started to lose it and got very fluffy and that side of her work went too far I feel but it's really great when she had that measure 
between the storytelling and the muscle and those messages. She was fantastic. So that's a great story in here. If you've never read it, The Ones Who Walk Away From Home Alas. And there's a great story in here by Damon Knight, who I'm often skeptical of. I find with Damon, I either find his stuff really overrated or fantastic. And the story's called Down There, which reminded me of the novel La Bar Down There by J.K. Heesmans, um, the founder, well, one of the key people in the decadent movement in France and um, really important writer. Down There was the first of a trilogy in Heisman's oeuvre. Uh, which is about Satanism and it's about conversion. It's Satanist who becomes a Catholic and it mirrored Heisman's own spiritual development. And Down There by Damon Knight, and there's definitely a reference, is about a guy in the future who basically writes short stories for magazines with the help of IBM, with AIs. The AI sort of, it's, it's really like the chat GP thing. And again, this is 73, it's a short story. And he goes to work for the day um, in a little office and he works on his stories. He buys some magazines on the way home to see whether his name's in the indicia and he looks away, he's got published. And then he spends some time, has something to eat, changes into some old clothes and then he goes and does something that a lot of men have done throughout history, which I'm not going to mention. And the ending's just fantastic and ambiguous and not shocking, but just, it's just real life in the future. Fantastic story down there by Damon Knight. Well done, Damon. I'm often critical of him hedging his bets on saying you can't define SF. I disagree, but we'll come on to that. A story called How Shall We Conquer by W. McFarlane, who I didn't know, which was really good, really sort of plangent, lovely tones, but aliens appearing from another world and they wear coloured body stockings and they want to invite mankind into this sort of hegemony um, of lots of other species and they've been around for like 30,000 years and it's about the sort of moral choices around that and it's good it's not quite front rank but you can see how McFarlane didn't quite make it as a, as a novel it would have been like a gentle Silverberg and I was a shame that never happened because it is quite interesting then there's They Live on Levels by Terry Carr I mean, Terry Carr is interesting, like Garner Dozoir. Great editor, but was he a great writer? There's a Dozoir in here, as there was in the first one. And I just never find his work compelling. You know, I really don't. And I said, at some point I will, but I've tried and tried. And his own work never does it for me. Then there's the Tiptree story. There's an R.A. Lafferty story. I much prefer Lafferty at novel length, I have to say. I think his verbal inventiveness and colour and the foamy floppiness of his prose can sometimes get in the way in a short story and you know it's if it builds into something if it's just wordplay and just Joyce in wordplay that can become a bit tiresome so uh, the jury is out for me still on Lafferty and I've read you know a few novels and short stories and I much prefer the novels but more on him again but he's becoming more and more of a cult figure again these days um, there's a Barry Marsberg story which ties into the paranoid astronauts thing which is like a short version of that very very good as always harsh dark existential needle point you know sort of gets you bleeding it's all good stuff and then there's a George Alec Effinger story called like, the Brown Foundry and Effinger's a funny one he's sort of like influenced by the new wave kind of surrealism really odd little stories in the 70s couple of novels one called what entropy means to me which is sort of a sword and sorcery structure in lots of ways and then he fell ill for a long time he had a big comeback in the 80s with a book called when gravity fails which is really good Harlan Ellison was a big fan of him and I'm going to reread some of his stuff soon and do something about him on the channel because he's kind of neglected I found a book by him at Zardoz I think it was the last year or earlier this year called Utopia 3. The real title is Death in Florence and I love anything Italian and I'm going to read that and talk about that on the channel soon and he may well come up in another themed video I'm working on. Um, there's a story by F.M. Busby, somebody I was aware of who did space operas and never read and it's a short story quite you know some people say disturbing i'm not disturbed by much i've read all sorts of things and it's about necrophilia um in the future and it's just about this one service in the future and again like the damon knight thing it's pretty interesting but you do get the feeling it was done just to shock and as harlan ellison said of course i wrote it to shock why do you think i did that and yeah uh, it was it was good but 
Does it go far enough? Probably not. There's a certain kind of Alice Cooper's dead babies feel about it, I must say. It was all right. It really was okay. But once you got over the initial thing, you wanted it to go somewhere and it didn't essentially go anywhere. There's a story about Gordon Eklund, Three Comedians, which is very, very up and down story about faith and religion. And a Dozewell story I didn't finish. So a mixed bag. So again, I'm finding with this that the things I really liked were the writers who endured the most and who still endure, Lagan, Tiptree, um, you know, they are probably the best ones in this. So the two best stories in this are by female SF writers in the early 70s and two of the most important ones. Hope you've enjoyed that. That's a little chat about cyberpunk precursors, rollerball, anthologies, corporates, marketing, what have you. Let's get the machinery really going now. Let's turn it over. Let's head forward into futurity like H.G. Wells' Time Traveller. This is Outlaw Bookseller, signing out for now. Bye.